Let's discuss that. So what we have is observations of a cross-section of individuals over time. That's what a panel data set is. So things vary across individuals, but they also vary over, over time. As a result, you no longer have the basic model where you are talking about yi being a function of xi, that's the input vector, and vi and ui, or you don't have a time series data, which we didn't mention so far, and you don't think about that much, but you can have a time series data in your model. So cross-section or time series, cross-section is more common, time series is, you can use it, but it's less common. With panel data, you have both. You have a cross-section observed over time, so your variables have uh, two indices, i, that for individuals going one to n, and t for time periods going one to t. So you are working with yit, and xit, and vit, and uit. Okay. So the basic model would be something like that. So good examples of panel data are like country level data, like World Bank data. If you look for GDP, labor, capital, or some other international organizations like FAO, they do on agriculture. If PRI does also collect data on agriculture. There are other databases on country level, uh, like CLEMS and so on. These are panel data. How do you analyze? Well, if you don't know about panel models, you just ignore the panel. Okay, and just say, I'm not going to bother about estimating panel data. All I know is OLS or SFA model. Let's just treat everyone as a separate observation. You think this is not done, it's done. This is what's called pooled data. You pull the data, you ignore its structure. So if I have data observed over countries over time, Australia in 1990 is treated as separate observation from Australia in 2009. Uh, pull that models, why are they useful? They are easier to estimate because there is no special technique needed other than the basic SFA, but they also help you to compare. So it's a good benchmark. It's like a way of testing your more complex models. So you can have pull data models, but that wouldn't allow you to exploit the panel structure. So if you ignore the panel, what you are saying is you are ignoring the fact that some of the observations are coming from the same form. You could explore that to learn more about the frontier. For example, other individual effects that you can pick up using repeated observations. So some farmers being, for example, less efficient because of the, the way they work or the practice they use. So what we are talking about is there is something that persists over time, like persistent inefficiency. So if someone's working hours are four days a week and has some other hobby and you ignore that, that's obviously affecting their output, but you are ignoring that. So they could have a different intercept like an alpha i. So that's why these panel data models have been around for a while, but there are different types of panel data models. How do they differ? Well, what's an individual effect? An individual effect is a characteristic of an individual that you cannot observe that's affecting production. Now, what exactly is that? Is that inefficiency or is it something else? Heterogeneity, that the farm is, for example, different, that the farmer has a different frontier. And we have been talking about this last time because <laughs> somebody could have just a better soil. So if they have a better soil, is that inefficiency or is that just a different frontier? If a farmer has a, a different type of management, for example, is that inefficiency or is that heterogeneity? Sometimes the distinction between heterogeneity and inefficiency is not clear. But if you want to be general, you want to allow for a difference between heterogeneity, which decides what the applicable frontier is, and usually it's about the intercept for the production function, and inefficiency. So you need to distinguish that. The other thing is, if there is inefficiency, and the inefficiency is an individual level a inefficiency, is it time invariant, which means it stays constant, or does it change over time, like decay, for example? If somebody is inefficient under normal circumstances, you would expect their efficiency level to decay. What does that mean? To be reduced over time. Why? Because they will learn that they are inefficient compared to others, they will improve. You could also have the opposite, where their efficiency level deteriorates over time because the company is getting worse. But if you have a long panel, especially, then do you allow for time variation, the inefficiency? So the older SFA models for panel data are simple. They were time invariant, so you just assume the inefficiency of a firm stays constant through the period. So simple, what that means is I have y i t being a function of x i t v i t, but u has only one subscript, that's i, there is no t, because it doesn't vary over time. So if I have country level data between 2011 and 2018, and I have a model like this, what that means is 
the efficiency of every country between 2011 and 2018 is constant. It varies between countries, but not for a country over time. So that's what we have now. In terms of the econometrics, there are two ways to model it. One is to think of it as a parameter. What that means is for every individual, there is a parameter UI that you have to estimate. Or you can think of it as a random variable. The UI comes from some kind of a distribution that has some parameters, let's say sit. Okay. What that means is if you have 150 countries, Every UI is coming from a distribution. Whereas this one treats as a parameter, just like the intercept is just a parameter. Okay? And there is no structure around it. So that's what they call fixed effects and random effects models. But this model doesn't allow for heterogeneity, difference between heterogeneity and inefficiency. This one is going to pick up everything. So you cannot distinguish, but that's a basic model. In terms of estimation, if it's assumed to be a fixed parameter, then it's like a dummy variable. A dummy variable. So the way it's estimated is you rearrange this, take the UI, subtract it from here, and then you get an individual specific intercept. And this can be estimated using OLS as dummy variables. So you estimate a separate intercept for every individual. So what happens if I have 200 observations, 200 individuals, like 200 countries, and I had capital and labor here? My model, which had capital, labor, and a constant, three variables, now has 202 variables. So this is why econometricians have other ways of estimating this called the, uh, the Wisden estimator or the first difference method. The alpha estimates are the mean of the uh, individual unit residual values. If you estimate this, you are going to get OLS residuals, OLS without an intercept, then the mean values within individual are U alpha i. How do you know what UI is? Well, they use a simple method, which is they take the maximum intercept from all the individual estimates and subtract from it the individual um, alpha i's to get UI. But there is a defect there. The defect is somebody is going to be, by default, 100% efficient. The individual with the maximum alpha i is going to be 100% efficient. So the efficiency terms are relative to that individual. So there will be at least one, which is 100% efficient. So when you get results from here and say, well, efficiency varies from 25% to 100%, you have to remember the 100% is an artifact. Any particular study, it's just how it is. So that's the fixed effects model, the random effects model. The advantage is because it's considered a random variable, you can have other variables in the model that would have been confounded with a fixed effect, like time invariant once and it's supposed to lead to more efficient estimates if you don't have correlation between the inefficiency term and other variables. But the estimation requires either a maximum likelihood estimation or a specialized least squares like generalized least squares. So both of these will give you an inefficiency that's constant over time. But a constant inefficiency can be quite restrictive, especially if the time period is long would be not appropriate to assume that the efficiency level of a firm doesn't vary. So some of the farm data that is being collected in Africa and Asia, for example, it has got like two or three periods. It's a short time period. So if you assume the inefficiency is constant over that period, it's not a very strong assumption. But if I take World Bank data for 20, 25 years and then assume the efficiency of a country is constant throughout that period, that's a very strong assumption, right? Because governments change, policies change. Some countries get better, some countries lag behind, and so on. 25 years is quite long. So you wouldn't want to assume that the efficiency level is constant over time if the data series, time series is long. So you need a more flexible version. One of the easiest ways people have tried is just come up with a trajectory. So what they have done is, well, yeah, okay, we'll allow efficiency to vary, but in a certain way, like along a trajectory, and that trajectory is given by a function of time, say g. So I might say, well, the efficiency level of the firm, efficiency term over time falls. So this efficiency decay, it decays out. So one of the better known examples is the Batis and Coley 92.1. Duty function being something that depends on the distance between the current and end period. Basically, what that means is ui is e to the power of eta t less t times the base level. So you would want, if efficiency is improving, 
well, then eta has to be less than zero. Okay, so if you find an, an eta estimate that's below zero, then that means efficiency is getting better. Okay. Kumbakar is another one. So I'm just giving you two examples. There are more examples. Now this is a quadratic one. How does this differ? Well, this is one or smaller than one. So if deltas are zero, then there is no efficiency change, obviously. But if deltas are positive, then efficiency is getting better over time, flexible. So that's another way. You can also not have function. So instead of having GT as a smooth function, I can have GT just as a step function. But the advantage of this is I am not imposing a structure on it. So it's free to decide the gap between the two. So allowing for time variation is good. It makes the model more flexible. But there is a problem. Why? The drawback is there is no room for technical change because technical change will be confounded with efficiency change because technical change is normally modeled as a function of time. So all these things, they don't distinguish heterogeneity from efficiency. Everything is attributed to inefficiency. And this is something that has no easy solution. And it's also not good to assume that efficiency is persistent. Even when you allow for variation over time, you are still imposing a structure. Why can't efficiency just vary around year to year? So I might be a good farmer, but this year I have uh, weddings to do. Okay, so it's going to be a very different year. I'm not going to work. Or the year after I have something else. So there is no reason why the efficiency change has to have a structure. There can be an element in efficiency that varies and there is no structure, okay? Assuming that's persistent or changes in a certain way, which is still a structure, is difficult because there can be one, firms can change efficiency, but there can be other elements in efficiency. Now, first, heterogeneity. So, Green has proposed models that are called two fixed and random effects models. So what you do here is, well, say, ignore persistent efficiency and just say firms are heterogeneous. So you have an alpha item for heterogeneity or individual effect. Now, whether it's a fixed parameter or random is what determines whether it's a fixed effect or random effect. Well, it's the assumption about alpha i. Is this a parameter like an intercept type? If that's the case, it is a fixed effect model. If it's uh, something that's a uh, random variable from a distribution, then it's a random effect model. What's the problem with this? There is only transient inefficiency. So what happens if you have persistent inefficiency? The persistent inefficiency would end up being heterogeneity. Okay, so if I do this, my efficiency estimates are going to change because I am basically say, a different way of looking at what the deviation from the average frontier is. So if I call it heterogeneity, then it's no longer efficiency, and that's what's going to happen. So separating heterogeneity from persistent inefficiency can be difficult. It's just things that you don't observe. So it shouldn't be surprising if someone allows for heterogeneity and all of a sudden their efficiency estimates are different. Yeah, they will be different because I am, I am allowing the frontier to be different for all different individuals. Okay, so that's the end of the story. Why not have everything? Recently, people have proposed something that brings all the elements together and allows for both time invariant heterogeneity and inefficiency. You have different components. You have heterogeneity, you have efficiency, but efficiency can be both persistent and transient. Okay, so persistent is the one that's like a UI and the transient is the one that varies between years for an individual uh, producer. So if I look at a producer, they can be different. Okay? They can have a different production frontier because they are different. They use different practices or they have something different. But that's one thing. That's the technology front. But then they can have inefficiency, but that efficiency doesn't have to be persistent. It can be persistent, so generally they tend to be inefficient compared to other firms that have the same technology because their management is different or they use different ways of doing things. For example, they plant late, or they are not very careful, or the way they harvest, or the way they do something, they will, or something, there is something different. So there is a persistent level of inefficiency that varies between individuals. But then, that's not the end of the story. I can have transient inefficiency, where for an individual, the level of inefficiency varies from year to year. And that has nothing to do with uh, something that's about practice, but could be something that have, depends on what happens in a year. Okay, like I was mentioning before, years maybe the farmer has something else to do, or the farmer is doing things differently. 
But if you do that, you can capture both persistent and transient, so that's a more general model. So in this case, we have firm effect or heterogeneity. The usual noise term, we have the persistent inefficiency, and then we have the transient inefficiency. That should be sub IT, I have to correct that. The heterogeneity term is time invariant, two-sided, so it can be both positive and negative. Persistent inefficiency is time invariant and one-sided because it's an inefficiency term. And URT is time varying in one side. Obviously, you are trying to split an error into four components. That's what's happening. To split the error into four components, how are you going to do that? So the fact that helps a bit is this is two-sided, and this is one-sided. Otherwise, you cannot distinguish them, okay? You cannot, if they are both two-sided or one-sided, you cannot distinguish them. There's and it's the same with here, two-sided, one-sided. Many of the other models we have seen are special cases. So what happens if I get rid of mu? I get models that decompose efficiency into transient and persistent only. Okay, we didn't discuss that, but there are models in the literature transient. If you remove eta, you get what? You get the two random mean effect or two fixed effect. Okay. If you remove this and UIT, then you get the older models, the random effects models and the fixed effects models. If you remove mu i and no, that should be eta i. Then what do we get? We get the cross section data. I have to correct this. We get the cross section data. Okay. So this is a very general model. The question is how do you estimate it? There are maximum likelihood methods that have been around since 2011 to estimate it. But that doesn't mean you can estimate it because the maximum likelihood model you need the software to estimate it. And Logit has incorporated the um, software in its lessest version. So if you have a new version, then you might be able to estimate it. There is multi-step procedures, and this is again described in the Kumbhaka 2015 book. Or you can do Beige. Estimates, again, this is also new because it's very new model. 